Hello everyone, this is Narina from 40k Theories and welcome to this new episode of 40k Law for Newcomers. For this episode, nominated on Patreon by Charlie Mink, we will be taking a brief look at the Death Watch chapter of the Adeptus Astartes. This video will be a brief overview for certain events that may be explored in greater depths within additional videos within the future. So, without further ado, let's begin! We do not hate the alien because he is different. We hate the alien because he has naught but hate in his heart for us. The Death Watch are a loyalist chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, established around the time of the fourth founding in M32. Like all Space Marines, each member of the Death Watch is a genetically enhanced transhuman super soldier whose strength, toughness, speed, and dexterity far surpasses that of a typical baseline human. The Death Watch are unique among the Adeptus Astartes in that they are not a typical chapter per se, but rather a specialist force whose warriors are actively drawn from other chapters to undertake a singular purpose, to combat the various alien races threatening humanity. To aid in this, the chapter, instead of being relegated to any one particular region within the galaxy, makes use of multiple bases of operation known as watch fortresses and watch stations, from which the chapter can rapidly dispatch kill teams and strike forces in immediate response to an emerging Xenos threat. While the chapter's role is to combat against the alien incursions, the Death Watch will also, on occasion, be tasked by the Order Xenos, a division of the Imperial Inquisition that the chapter falls under the purview of, with recovering Xenos artifacts or weaponry. Not only can such devices be studied for the Imperium to better counteract them, but the Death Watch will even adapt and utilize such technology to their own ends, making them one of the few organizations whose use of non-human, non-sanctioned weaponry and technology is officially permitted by the Imperium. As such, the Death Watch serve as one of the Imperium's most elite fighting forces, humanity's black shield that suffers not the alien to live. The enemies of the Emperor fear many things. They fear discovery, defeat, despair and death. Yet there is one thing they fear above all others. They fear the wrath of the Space Marines. The Death Watch can trace their origins back to mid-M32 during the course of a great conflict known within the historical records as the War of the Beast. The Imperium, still recovering from the effects of the Horus Heresy, a civil war which occurred just over a thousand years prior, came under full-scale assault from a savage and warlike Xenos race known as the Orcs. The Orcs, under the command of an exceptionally large, powerful and intelligent warlord known simply as the Beast, cut a swath of destruction across the galaxy, laying waste to thousands of worlds in the process. In an attempt to cut the head off of the proverbial snake, a vast force under the command of both Corland, the chapter master of the Imperial Fists and Lord Commander of the Imperium, and the recently rediscovered Primarch Vulcan of the Salamanders, consisting of multiple Space Marine chapters and regiments of the Astra Militarum, launched a full-scale invasion of Alenor, a world where the beast itself was said to be located. The attack proved to be a complete and total disaster, not only would Imperial forces sustain heavy losses, due in part to severely underestimating their foes, but Vulcan himself was seemingly slain following the detonation of the reactor core powering the beast's temple gargant, with the resulting blast wave vaporizing everything within its vicinity, forcing the Imperium to withdraw. After monitoring Orkish communications for several weeks, it became clear that despite the apparent death of the beast, the Greenskin still had a leader. Corland then proposed to the High Lords of Terror a new course of action, a series of kill teams drawn from those space marines that survived the invasion of Alanor would be assembled to strike at key strategic targets and eliminate key figures within the Orc chain of command. These kill teams would also answer directly and only to Corland, much to the horror of the High Lords. Indeed, when it came time to vote on whether or not to approve the formation of these kill teams, 
only Draken Vangorich, the Grand Master of the Officio Assassinorum, voted in favour of the formation of Corlan's plan. However, following the reactivation of an orc attack moon in Terra's orbit, which had been disabled earlier in the war, Corland was able to finally convince the High Lords to authorize the formation of his kill teams, whose members would dub themselves the Death Watch in memory of the Battle Brothers that fell upon Alanor. While the Death Watch proved to be incredibly successful in their mission against the Orcs, many of the High Lords were still skeptical of such an elite fighting force answering to just one man. Corland reached a compromise with Margaret Wienand, the High Lords' inquisitorial representative, ensuring that the Death Watch would operate under the authority of the Inquisition itself. A chapter master would then be appointed for the Death Watch, with the honor falling to a space wolf named Asker Warfest. Following the aftermath of the War of the Beast, Margareth Wienand, along with fellow Inquisitor Kirill Sinderman, divided the Inquisition into two separate Ordos, with Wienand becoming the founder of the Ordo Xenus and Sinderman the founder of the Ordo Malleus, with the Death Watch becoming the Chamber Militant for the former, while the Grey Knights became one for the latter. Suffer not the alien to live! Over the course of their existence, the Death Watch has taken part in innumerable missions and campaigns, including the Lockroll Xenocides, the Crusade of Fire, the Purging of Castilium, and many more besides. One of the chapter's more notable engagements was the Battle of Port de Mesnes. In 999 M41, the Eldari Farseer Eldred Ulthran, after learning of the existence of Coheria, a moon comprised predominantly of psychoreactive crystal that once existed on the outermost borders of the Eldari Empire, concocted a plan to bring about the awakening of Inead, the nascent Eldari guard of the dead. The Farseer believed that should Inead be successfully awakened, his people would then be finally freed from the threat of Slanesh, the Chaos God of Excess and the bane of the Eldari race. However, while Coheria itself had remained untouched for thousands of years, the planet it lay in orbit of, known now as Port de Mesnes, now belonged to the Imperium of Man. Realizing that he couldn't risk the humans interfering with his plans, Eldred dispatched a host of warriors drawn from Kraftworld's Althway and Saim Hun to lay waste to Port de Mesnes, so that he, with the aid of Harlequins from the Mask of Midnight Sorrow, could conduct the ritual without being disturbed or discovered. Eldred lamented that such warriors were sent unknowingly to their deaths, but should his plan succeed, then it would at least not have been in vain. The defenders of Port de Mesnes were quick to transmit an astropathic distress signal in response to the sudden assault, which was answered by Death Watch forces from the nearby Watch Fortress of Talassa Prime. But, as the Astartes battled to defend the world against the alien aggressors, a kill team led by Watch Captain Artemis, realizing that the invasion of the world was little more than a diversion, commandeered a Corvus Blackstar aircraft and made for Kohiri itself much to the anger of his watch commander, Mordelai. As the Death Watch approached the ritual site, Eldred sent a telepathic message to Artemis, pleading with him to not go through with his attack, instead suggesting that the two should join forces against a common enemy. Artemis refused, stating he would rather see the death of a trillion human souls than trust the word of a Zenus. The resulting battle between the Harlequins and Death Watch was a short but bloody affair, with the Death Watch ultimately succeeding in stopping Eldred's ritual. With the rite disrupted, the Eldari were forced to flee into the webway, while Coheria, having become saturated with psychic energy, shattered and exploded. Thanks to Artemis's actions, billions of human lives were saved, albeit inadvertently, if the Farseer's plan had succeeded, it would have resulted in millions of human ships becoming trapped within the depths of warp space, as Coheria would have become, for lack of a better term, a psychic sun that would have eclipsed even the Astronomicon with its intensity. Artemis and the warriors of his command returned to Talassa Prime, though it remains unclear if they were ultimately vindicated for taking the initiative or punished for disobeying a direct order from their commanding officer.
Honor your chapter, and your name shall be remembered. Honor your Primark, and your name shall be respected. Honor the Emperor, and your name will be legend. The Death Watch are a Codex Divergent chapter, meaning that they do not fully adhere to the guidelines and tenets laid out within the Codex Astartes, the text penned by the Ultramarine's Primarch Rebuta Gilliman that details the organizational structure and tactics to be followed by the Adeptus Astartes as a whole. Instead of the chapter being separated into ten companies of a hundred marines as with most chapters, each watch fortress will house five demi-companies of marines, with each of these demi-companies being comprised of a mere fifty warriors each, which are subdivided even further into various kill teams. Given that there are dozens of watch fortresses throughout the Imperium, this in turn means that the Death Watch are one of the few chapters permitted to exceed the Codex mandated maximum of thousand warriors. Each watch fortress will then in turn be overseen by a watch commander, typically a watchmaster, a rank that was once synonymous with that of chaptermaster. Over time, however, as the Death Watch itself steadily became more and more of a decentralized organization, the rank of Watchmaster would come to denote the overall commander for each Watch Fortress as opposed to the chapter as a whole. Interestingly, there have been a number of documented instances where a Fortress Watch Commander wasn't an Astartes at all, but rather a member of the Inquisition, although such occurrences are fairly uncommon overall. In regards to recruitment, the Death Watch draws the majority of recruits via a tithing system. Hundreds of Space Marine chapters have sworn ironclad vows to regularly send some of their warriors to serve within the Death Watch for prolonged periods of time. Once an Astartes has been seconded for the Death Watch, their armor will be repainted black and their chapter heraldry removed, save for that displayed upon their right side pauldron so as to not offend the armor's machine spirit. Their left side pauldron will also be replaced with one adorned displaying the inquisitorial rosette as a symbol of their role as an alien hunter. Once a warrior has been deemed as completing their service to the Death Watch, their old armor will be restored to its original colors and they will be returned to their chapter, though they will retain their new left side pauldrons to display as a badge of honor to their battle brothers. As a result of this unusual method of recruitment, the Death Watch are one of the few chapters to not make use of scout squads, as such units are typically comprised of novice aspirants that have yet to become a fully-fledged space marine, although on rare occasions a chapter will send an experienced scout sergeant as part of their servicing tithe. The other avenue of recruitment utilized by the Death Watch is via the use of warriors known as Black Shields. These Black Shields are individuals that have severed all ties to their parent chapter, leaving their armor completely devoid of any and all iconography. The reasoning behind a warrior becoming a Black Shield can vary drastically between individuals, as one Black Shield may be a surviving loyalist from a chapter that has turned traitor, whereas another may have become a Black Shield in an attempt to regain his lost honor. While Black Shields may often be viewed with distrust, even contempt by other members of the Death Watch, such warriors are too valuable an asset to simply discard out of hand. As such, should a Black Shield arrive at a Watch Fortress, the Watchmaster will more often than not accept them into their ranks, providing that the Black Shield can successfully plead their case. Should a Black Shield be accepted into the ranks of the Death Watch, then they will remain within the chapter for the rest of their lives, where upon their deaths they will be entombed within a Watch Fortress's Hall of Heroes. And that concludes this edition of 40k Lore for Newcomers. If you like this video, consider supporting us on Patreon for more content. To everyone who's new to 40k, we hope you learned something. So, leave a comment below, and thanks for watching!